Welcome to Good Doctor and Video Blog, episode 10. Finally, we're back after a week with a new episode. I wanted to ask a question that some of you are probably asking after having seen the last couple of episodes, and that is, is the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost dangerous or misleading doctrine? The reason you might be asking that is because this is not taught regularly in Sunday school, in church, over the pulpit. So, is this real doctrine, or is somebody trying to mislead you at this point? Obviously, my viewpoint is that this is some of the most beautiful doctrine that exists in the scriptures. It is everywhere. And I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of this today, but we'll come back in future episodes and show you even more. Now, remember, this whole thing started as we began to review the doctrine of Christ. This is Nephi teaching, and in 2 Nephi chapters 31 and 32, he outlines the very simple and plain doctrine of Christ. And he says, But behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me. Now notice that this is the voice of Christ. And he says, After you have repented of your sins and witnessed unto the Father that ye are willing to keep my commandments by the baptism of water, and have received the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, there we go, and can speak with a new tongue, yea, even with the tongue of angels. There are actually three baptisms here. Baptism of water, baptism of fire, and of the Holy Ghost. And then there is a result here that we're going to see in the future. You can speak with a new tongue, even with the tongue of angels. And he says that this is important enough and after this should deny me, it would have been better for you that you had not known me. So this is going to be a powerful, powerful testimony of Christ. And I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Now notice here, this is something fairly unusual in the scriptures, actually very unusual. We get the voice of the Father. Generally, when you hear the voice of the Father in the scriptures, when the Father has something to say, he's confirming the actions or the words of the Son of Christ. And here is the voice of the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, is so important that it wasn't only introduced and spoken by the mouth of Christ himself, but also the Father confirmed it by his own voice that this was the true doctrine. So we should probably pay attention, but let's go see if we can find evidence of this elsewhere in Scripture. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 39, And verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth my gospel receiveth me, and he that receiveth not my gospel receiveth not me. And this is my gospel, repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, even the Comforter, which showeth all things and teacheth the peaceable things of the kingdom. So there we go. We've got the baptism of water and of fire and the Holy Ghost. And as a result here, he says, we are going to be taught the peaceable things of the kingdom. A new level of revelation to us. And then again in DNC 19, And of tenets thou shalt not talk, but thou shalt declare repentance and faith on the Savior and remission of sins by baptism and by fire, yea, even the Holy Ghost. This is a fantastic scripture because we have faith, repentance, baptism by fire and the Holy Ghost. So you have the entire doctrine of Christ encapsulated in this one verse. And it's important enough that now we've heard twice in the Doctrine of Covenants that this is the gospel. This is what we need to be focusing on. This is what saves. Let's move on. New Testament. In Luke 24, Christ said, now this is Christ after he's resurrected, and he tells them just before he leaves, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. So this endowment of power from on high, what is it? Is this the Holy Ghost? Is this something else? We get a little clarification in Acts chapter 1. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, 
ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So what they were waiting around for in Jerusalem, what they were commanded to wait around for, was this endowment of power from on high, or, in other words, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now we see that in the next chapter, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now this language here, cloven tongues as of fire, is a strange phrase, but if you can think of fire coming down from heaven, and when you say cloven tongues, it divides into individual pillars and comes and sits upon each of them. So here we are seeing the fire, the heavenly fire that is coming down and sitting on each one of them. So that is the baptism of fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, isn't that fascinating that this speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance is exactly what Christ said we would receive and we would be able to speak with the tongue of angels. So you see, the baptismal elements of fire and the Holy Ghost and the tongue of angels. Let's go back to the Book of Mormon. We talked about this already, 3 Nephi chapter 9. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This is a commandment. Ye shall offer. This is a commandment to us to offer a broken heart and a contrite spirit. How do we know if we have sufficiently offered a broken heart and a contrite spirit? It's probably important that we know that because this is a commandment to us. It says here, And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost. Even as the Lamanites. Now, we read in Helaman chapter 5 this exact account of the Lamanites being baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost. And what Christ is saying here is that he will baptize us with fire and the Holy Ghost, not in some ethereal manner that we can't detect. But you remember the account that we read was that actual heavenly fire came down and they were engulfed, they were baptized and overcome by that same fire and the Holy Ghost. Christ promises here that we will be baptized even as the Lamanites, which means in the same way as the Lamanites were. As a result of our broken heart and our contrite spirit. Helaman chapter 5, here it is. They were encircled about, yea, every soul by a pillar of fire. This is kind of like those cloven tongues of fire coming down from heaven. And Nephi and Lehi were in the midst of them, yea, they were encircled about, yea, they were as if in the midst of a flaming fire, yet it did not harm them, neither did it take hold upon the walls of the prison, and they were filled with joy, which is unspeakable and full of glory. And behold, the Holy Spirit did come down from heaven, and it did enter into their hearts, and they were filled as if with fire, and they could speak forth marvelous, marvelous words. Now, do you see those elements here? We have a pillar of fire. We have the Holy Ghost, and they could speak forth mar marvelous words. Tongue of angels. So that promise that we heard from Christ that Nephi quoted is fulfilled here. It's also fulfilled in the New Testament. It's talked about in the Doctrine and Covenants. It really, as I said before, everywhere in the scriptures, if you begin to look for it. Now, I know that Mormon doctrine, the book, is not scripture. But what I want to illustrate here is that this is not new doctrine. This is doctrine that has existed from New Testament times to the introduction of the Book of Mormon in 1829. It was talked about by Joseph Smith. It's in the Doctrine and Covenants. And Bruce R. McConkie in his book, Mormon Doctrine, also talks about it. This is not just me. To gain salvation, every accountable person 
must receive two baptisms. They are baptism of water and of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit is called the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. By the power of the Holy Ghost, who is the sanctifier, dross, iniquity, carnality, sensuality, and every evil thing is burned out of the repentant soul as if by fire. The cleansed person becomes literally a new creature of the Holy Ghost. He is born again. Now McConkie says here, this person becomes literally a new creature in the Holy Ghost. This reminds me of a quote by Joseph Smith, which I didn't understand before, but now I do. He said, the effect of the Holy Ghost upon a Gentile is to purge out the old blood and make him actually of the seed of Abraham. That man that has none of the blood of Abraham, naturally, must have a new creation by the Holy Ghost. In such a case, there may be more of a powerful effect upon the body and visible to the eye than upon an Israelite, while the Israelite at first might be far before the Gentile in pure intelligence. I love this phrase in Moroni chapter 10, verse 7. Wherefore, I would exhort you that ye deny not the power of God, for he worketh by power. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is powerful enough to change us, to make us new creatures. The gift of the Holy Ghost is not some ethereal, undetectable, unnoticeable, purely gradual thing that we won't know whether we got until the next life. God wishes to work in power through us. Again in Moroni 10, And now I speak unto all the ends of the earth, that if the day cometh that the power and gifts of God shall be done away among you, it shall be because of unbelief. And woe be unto the children of men, if this be the case, for there shall be none that doeth good among you, no, not one. For if there be one among you that doeth good, he shall work by the power and gifts of God. If we don't have the power and the gifts of God, if we don't have great manifestations of the gifts of God in us, it is not because of a lack of desire on God's part. It is probably because of a lack of work and connection to God on our part. Now remember, after Nephi taught the doctrine of Christ, he said this, And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men. For they will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as word can be. Nephi saw our day. He saw who we were, and he saw that we were going to resist the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. And he talks to us directly in Second Nephi 28, verse 24, speaking to us, he says, Therefore, woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Woe be unto him that crieth all is well. I have enough gifts of the Spirit. Yea, woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men, and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. This gift of the Holy Ghost and this power of God is what God wishes to bestow upon us with a baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost. It is the endowment of power from on high that is spoken of in the New Testament and that was given on the day of Pentecost. There is a great amount of evidence in the scriptures that if we give up our broken heart and our contrite spirit and come to God, that he will also endow us with this power from on high. And we'll continue to talk about that in the next episode.